So when we began our little short intermittent series uh, on Philemon a couple of weeks ago, I, I did have you cast your mind back to the events of 2020, in particular the, the race riots in the US and the subsequent protests here in Australia in the name of Black Lives Matter. Even here, we had protesters gathering to fight the system and demand justice over the black deaths that were in custody. It was a time of, of high emotion, incredible division amongst people, underpinned by, in many instances, some ideologies that promote and foster these distinctions amongst people and people groups. Ironically, under the pretense of reconciliation. You see, today, I want to draw you your attention to the continuation of these ideologies and thoughts and situations in our world today. Have you noticed recently the talk in our country has taught, turned to flags? Has anybody seen this in the news, in press conferences? Some flags have now come to new prominence on bridges across the country, in parliament, in press conferences. Some flags have been sought to removed from certain press conferences. I don't know if you've sat through many acknowledgement of country ceremonies. These things continue in Parliament. Uh, they're read in public events, in many schools. There's footers on the bottom of emails, you may note, in your organisation. There are now a push to make changes to the Australian Constitution and start to recognise some divisions of peoples within Australia on this basis. Everywhere we look, it seems, we are reminded of the past sins, of cultural differences, and this constant bringing of these things before our eyes in the name of reconciliation. I was scrolling through my social uh, media feed recently and I came across a post that caught my attention. It was a sponsored ad and it was po a post by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now they've been strangely uh, silent over the last few years on many issues, but they've found something that they want to push. Now, let me read it to you. It says, we know that racism at school impacts educational outcomes. We also know that what we teach in classrooms matters. We need to build racial literacy and truth-telling into the curriculum. Now there is, as I read this, a grave danger hidden under very virtuous sounding language. It can be harder to spot and, and it can be even harder to maybe resist or, or put your hand up and say, now, now hang on, what is going on here? For who doesn't want to acknowledge that racism is an evil? And, and who doesn't want to acknowledge that there was much harm done in our past. We all know truth is of paramount importance and we should all be about truth. And who amongst us does not want reconciliation? But there's a danger and I want to point it out because in essence the post is getting at a certain few things if you can recognise some terminology and some definitions. You see, racism in this setting is presupposed, it is assumed, and any variation in outcome is therefore proof of it. This person suffers from alcohol abuse or poor life expectancy or disproportionate negative results and outcomes in school, then that is because of racism and that is your fault. And it is your fault by virtue of you are a part of an institution and a structure which has become racialized and racist. And this perpetuates the power structures of the day of which you benefit unknowingly. Therefore, you and your children must be re-educated to see these problems and actively fight against it. To decolonize the power structures of the day. Now, this is entirely an unchristian way to approach these situations, no matter how virtuous it may appear. It is actually bent on the deconstruction of society 
and the unity that we do have. It has no positive contributions to make. What it does is it seeks to separate and to segregate, to stereotype, to hold on to past wrongs, hurts, grudges, be they imagined or be they very real. It is an endless class warfare with the pointing of fingers and the shifting of blame. There is no forgiveness, no grace, no repentance, no gospel, no reconciliation. And as Christians, how do we navigate these sorts of times? We turn to the simple truths proclaimed in the word of God. And we preach a gospel of reconciliation. First and foremost, on the behalf of each individual with God himself. It is mankind's alienation from God that all other, their other ailments proceed from. And it is only as we are reconciled with God that we come to be reconciled with one another. In Philemon, and here is the point that I want to make, there is no record of the person oppressing another. No dismantling of an institution. There is no liberation theology. There is no class warfare. There is no fixation upon the past wrongs or hurts by any of the individuals involved. Rather, as we read through, we see that the power of the gospel comes to the fore. It has a power to transform not only our vertical relationship with God, who is now our Father, but it impacts all our horizontal relationships as well with our fellow believers, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Note these words as we've read through Philemon so far. Beloved, brother, sister, fellow, love, sharing, joy, comfort, heart. I think of the picture that is creating amongst these people as Paul writes this letter. And that's all just words drawn from the first seven verses, which we looked at last time. You see, the core of the letter of Philemon is a shared communion with God that forms the basis of a shared life with one another, as close family bonds and affections as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's recap just a portion to get us up to speed. You see, Paul writes this, the shortest of his letters to Philemon, in, who was an apparently wealthy benefactor of the church who met in his home. The greeting is short, but it's very warm. And although Philemon came to faith underneath Paul, they had been separated for some time. And Paul is always eager to hear of the progress of his converts. And he has brought great joy and comfort as he considers the reports of this man, Philemon, who has grown in love. Not only does he possess great love and faith towards God and towards Jesus Christ, but this overflows in practical ways for his brothers and sisters, whose hearts, Paul says, are refreshed. And for this, Paul is thankful. And, he's, and in, because he sees the clear working of God in Philemon's heart in these ways, he pours out thankfulness to God for this and he prays pointedly and purposefully and then he puts a request to Philemon that his faith would overflow towards all his brothers and sisters. Particularly, he has in mind a specific request and we get to that this week. He wants reconciliation between Philemon and his runaway slave. Anesimus. And this is the focus of our, verse, of, our, of our time here this morning. We're going to look at verses 8 to 16. We'll do this under four main points, the first of which is a better way. Beginning in verse 8. Having said all that and having offered all those prayers to God, Paul says, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command to you to do what is required, See, Paul is here alluding to his right and his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. In many of Paul's other letters, he regularly acknowledges his, himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, what did this entail that he was an apostle? Well, the first thing was that he had been a witness of the resurrected 
Christ. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He was the last of the apostles to see Jesus. And he was at that time personally then appointed by Christ to be his representative and sent on behalf of Christ. Acts 26, 15 to 16, it says, The Lord said, Rise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have seen. So Paul was an apostle sent and commissioned by Christ and he carried an unrivaled authority within that church as an apostle of Christ. Read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 36 to 38, it says this, Or was it from you that the word of God came, writing to the Corinthians church? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. And if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. You see, a reception of Paul's apostolic authority was a test of the true spirituality of those who heard him. And if one did not recognize that what Paul said were the very commands of Christ, they were not to be recognized amongst the churches. And yet, in writing to Philemon, Paul seeks a better way. He says, I'm not going to appeal to you on the basis of my authority in Christ, which I could do. Yet, verse 9, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. You see, Paul's, Paul's preference wasn't to rest on the authority of his office, but to appeal in love. Now, the aim was going to be the same. That Philemon do what was required is how Paul puts it. What was right, what was fitting, what was proper. It wasn't an arbitrary request that Paul was asking. It was the right thing to do. You see, Paul's authority was not a boundless authority. His authority was in and under Jesus Christ, and his commands were a command of Jesus Christ. There was a certain right, proper, fitting thing that Philemon was to do, but he was to do it in love. He could either attain that, Paul, by commanding, but or he wanted to lay that aside. He said, I prefer to appeal to you in love, brother. Would you do this in love from my heart to your heart that the saints would be refreshed by your love? And the outworking of that love would produce the same effect as what Paul could do by rightful command. And this, Paul shows us, is a better way. You see, we have much to learn from Paul in this, in many areas of our lives. You know this, parents, within the home. We are certainly given authority, and it is right to teach our children the commandments of God regarding obedience to parents, and then to exercise that authority as well. It reinforces appropriate submission and obedience to all forms of authority, especially God himself. But however, a bare obedience isn't the aim. You aim as a parent at more than just to see a certain act performed. Rather, we are aimed at the molding of a character, the shaping of a person, the recognition that what we're aiming at, that what we're asking them to do is not just the thing that should be done, an arbitrary thing that we want done to please us, but it's the right thing to do. It's good and fitting and proper and have their aim to do that and to be that, that they would do it from an inner compulsion to do what is right, to do what is fitting, to do what is pleasing, not by command, not just for fear of punishment, but by free choice. As a parent, you have these battles often, and it, my desire isn't just for a, a clean room. That's not what I'm aiming for, although I'd love a clean room. It's not just empty plates at the dinner table. When sometimes you've had those battles, eat. You've just got to eat. Five more mouthfuls, six more mouthfuls, whatever the case may be. Um, you see, a dictator devoid of love can accomplish those same results, a clean room and an empty plate. But rather, we aim at self-disciplined, motivated, organized, and competent, loving children who understand our desire for those things and recognize the value of them themselves. 
And then the children we want to see walk, not by constant compulsion or, or threat, but in a self-propelled, willing obedience. What is the joy of that as a parent? John Calvin here applies this, this passage to pastors, stating that they should endeavor to draw disciples gently rather than drag them by force. And it's the same wherever we seek to exercise our rightful authority. We need to imitate that which Paul is modeling to us here. Identify the grace of God at work within a person. Pray in accordance with that grace and then encourage them further in the exercise of that grace. And in so doing, our ever-present, demanding, commanding authority becomes almost redundant as God through his Holy Spirit and through our prayers and encouragement sees that same proper end obtained in a much better way. And it is this that Paul reiterates, if you turn down a couple of verses, again in verse 13 and 14. It is a constant push within this letter that I'm not going to command you there's a better way. Verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. And for parents, you know that that is preferred. What an absolute joy that the clean room is not by compulsion, but of their own accord. The dishwasher is loaded and turned on of their own accord. The homework done, the pets fed, the clean washing put away, the beds made and teeth brushed, all of their own accord. What a joy. What a better way. It sounds like a dream. <laughs> but to this we all aim. Not to a bare obedience, but the self-motivated obedience of love. We move on to the second point, a transforming gospel. Pick it up in verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. We're now approaching the heart of the letter. And Paul begins to narrow down his request to get very specific. But consider for a moment the wonder of the event that Paul has just described. In prison, Paul became Onesimus' father. This is a language that Paul uses elsewhere. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, he says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus, Jesus through the gospel. Clearly, this describes Paul becoming the father of a certain people because it was he who preached the gospel to them and saw them saved. They heard the gospel, they repented, and they believed under the preaching of Paul. They were born again, they were regenerated. And in this sense, Paul could count them as his own children. He was their father. And it's that relationship that Paul describes as having taken place with Philemon. I became his father in prison. And we can't ignore the wonder of that event. When a sinner repents and turns to Christ, that is nothing short of a miracle. We have heard it over a number of weeks uh, as Pastor Josh has, has led us through the book of John. The sovereignty of God in salvation, the effectual calling through the word by the Holy Spirit of a people unto himself that somebody dead in sin could rise in newness of life. The word preach must be accomplished by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's that very thing which has taken place within the heart of Anesimus. He experienced new birth, regeneration. It, it, it gave rise to a new and living faith and, and a God-hating rebel, a runaway slave losing himself in Rome was brought to obedience. First to his maker and then we see a submission to Paul and his earthly master as well. And that inner working of God, that transformation, that regeneration has immediate outworking in his life. Verse 11, Paul says, Formerly, he was useless to you, 
but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And it's here worth, worth pointing out, as many do at this point, that the meaning of the name Onesimus. You see, the name Onesimus, as a bit of play on words that Paul is using here, literally meant useful. And it was a common a, a slave or bondservant name of the day that they would be called such in the hope that they would be such. And Paul said, I know he is called useful, but he has been useless. But because of the work that God has done in his heart, I am sending him back to you, no longer useless, but now useful. This is the power of the gospel in a person's life. It is a, a, a power that transforms that person. There will be a lifetime of outworking that usefulness and that change, a process of sanctification, if you will. But the, the divine impetus involved in regeneration set someone on a course that is irrepressible. It can't be undone. There is some progress, some steps moving forward, and he was useless, but he is now useful to you. What God starts, he finishes, and he sets someone on a journey. Onesimus, we see, had a living faith, and Paul could testify it. This is real, what has happened in the life of this person. I can see the results. And he was confident that Philemon would see it as well. Think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. I might read these few verses to you. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. When we are born again, when we are regenerated and respond in faith and repentance to the gospel of Christ, we become a new creation. The old is done away with. We go from useless to useful. And that is a point that Paul is emphasizing here. Note as we begin to move further through, we, we move down to verse 13. He's not just appealing on behalf of Onesimus, and it is important to touch on this as we go, but he's appealing for Onesimus. Verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. See, the crux of Paul's appeal, the point of which he's writing, is that Onesimus would be released by Philemon and sent back to serve and help and minister to Paul. And the point is, he doesn't want that done begrudgingly or forced upon Philemon, but he wants that to be a willing and free choice. Move on to point three of four here. I want to take a moment to stop and discuss the sovereignty and the providence of God that we see at work in the book of Philemon. And I must make note of this whenever I come up across it, which is on most pages of scripture, I must admit, because growing up outside of the Reformed uh, church, this, this doctrine was something that I balked at a little bit. But I've now come to see it on almost every page of scripture. And it's wonderfully rich and practically relevant. R.C. Sproul declared, there is no maverick molecule in all the universe. That's intensely comforting. And as famously described by C.H. Spurgeon, the, pillow, uh, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you can lay your head at night. Let us draw comfort from the providence of God in the lives of Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul, as we see it revealed in these verses. Look at verse 15. He says, for perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see, at this point, Paul just cannot help but stop and wonder and marvel 
at the, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. It is quite a fantastical set of events, if you stop and think about it. And the fingerprints of God are all over it. You cannot help but notice God guiding, predestinating, superintending beforehand these good works. Except we're not just applying this over the scripture because we believe in these things as a doctrine, but I want to yeah, actually see it on the pages, the hints at it. God's involvement arises from the text itself. So we discussed last time in Paul's prayer, Paul is acknowledging that the practical outworking of love in Philemon's life is something that God deserves the praise for. Therefore, we can see that God was the, the foundation of these good works within the life of Philemon. But there's further evidence of this within verse 15 itself. First, Paul wonders why this happened. Now, to wonder why something happened, Paul is acknowledging that there was a purpose for something happening. There was a reason behind it. Now, something can only have purpose if there is intention, if there is someone driving a set of events, looking to accomplish something. So to even consider, I wonder why this happened, is an acknowledgement that it is, has happened for a purpose. The world and its happenings to Paul were not the result of random laws or the, the free and uncontrolled willings of men. No, the events and circumstances of Paul's life were happening according to the mind of Christ. And Paul wondered, I wonder why God is doing this in my life. You see, purpose presupposes providence. Now, there is, of course, more, because this is the first time that we've been introduced to the idea that Onesimus had left his master, Philemon. But note the terminology that, that Paul uses to describe it. He says, this perhaps is why he was parted from you. And that raises a question, who did the parting? And two things should be obvious if you stop and if you think. Not Onesimus, because he was parted from Philemon. But it also wasn't Philemon, because Onesimus was parted from him. So who did the parting? And the answer is God. That's exactly right. You see, this is, happens often throughout Scripture. We can read past these things, but there's, there's what is sometimes called a divine passive. It's like, who did this thing? It's not saying. It's saying that something happened, that somebody did it, but it's who. And the unnamed person is God. He is the implied subject. We see this also in the letter of Philemon, down in verse 22. He says, At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Through the prayers of the people, Paul would be given, i.e. released from prison and sent back to the people. Who does the giving in that instance, it is clearly God working in and through all things, unnamed yet working in all things. You see, many who propose alternatives to this, to this story do so because of the perceived unlikeliness of it. How could Onesimus just happen to run into Paul under arrest in a large city 2,000 kilometers away who just happened to know his master, Philemon? It seems too fanciful. And so they seek to construct some other backstory. But since when has the fanciful or unlikeliness of an event been an indicator of its truthfulness? You see, is anything too hard for God? And if we expect to see God in work at all things, working all things for his glory and for our good, then what would it matter how fanciful the events seemed to the human or the natural mind? God is at work in all things. And we can't go beyond the account of Joseph at this point, which we read earlier in the service. Joseph was sold by slavery sold into slavery by his brothers, sent to Egypt, falsely accused, locked in prison, 
and then rose to second in command over all Egypt, paved the way for the nation and the surrounding countries to make it through the famine, before meeting up with his brothers many years later and bringing them to abundance in Egypt. That's an unlikely set of events. And yet Joseph's understanding of that as revealed in Scripture, Genesis 45 verse 8, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Indeed, Scripture is full of the stories of the unlikely victories of the saints, of God's people. And the divine story is purposefully so that to God alone would be the glory. And so we see God at work here in an incredible way in the lives of these people. But note, just as we begin to move on to our final point, something to stop and pause. Paul is not wondering if God is involved. He acknowledges the sovereignty, the providence of God. But he is wondering what his purpose might be. Scripture is clear. God is sovereign. He has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. And when something happens, we know that God has decreed it. The struggle, the unknown, the burden, the frustration sometimes can be with the why. Why did this happen? Because these events can sometimes be hard or harsh or cause us anxiousness or struggle or or hurt or harm, it may seem to us. And see, without divine special revelation, the why might not be accessible to us and to our human minds and and we should not know with certainty and we should learn from Paul here because he does ponder perhaps perhaps this is why I know that it has happened I know God is working to an end I know that is good but I should ponder lightly the perhaps and the whys for each individual event and there's great wisdom in that Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord our God But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. I have a a quote here from John John Flavel, a Puritan preacher, says this, Pry not too curiously into the secrets of providence, nor suffer your shallow reason arrogantly to judge and censure its designs. Reason never shows itself more unreasonable than in summoning those things to its bar which transcend its sphere and capacity. We should be humble before the hand of God and seek to walk in obedience to his word, that which he has given to us, knowing that he is working in and through all things for his glory and for our good simple obedience. We move on to our our final point for this morning. Number four, an eternal reconciliation. You see, why Paul pondered why, one thing to him was clear. God himself had parted and God had also reunited these men. Verse 15, for This perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. You see, God's hand was upon all these things, the trip to Rome, the meeting with Paul, Onesimus' conversion, and now he's returning to Philemon. And this this parting, this, this whole sequence of events was but temporary, and a reconciliation which Paul brought the two together for was going to be an eternal reconciliation. It would be forever. Why? Not only would they be reunited in the flesh and have their relationship restored, but a new spiritual bond had been formed between these two men, which would endure for eternity. What a wonderful thing. Verse 16, receive him back no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And Paul here begins to to bring out into the open this reconciliation with with which he drives and aims at in this letter. It's the reconciliation between these two men. And it is worth pointing out and noting as we move through. I don't believe he's necessarily asking Philemon to set 
Onesimus completely free. You see, you note that he says there, he says, no longer as a servant, take him back no longer as a bondservant, but he says, but more than a bondservant. So that's the impression of, don't take him back only as a bondservant, see him as more. I want you to be reconciled in your earthly relationships, but do that in the knowledge that he is also so much more than that to you. And this is reiterated at the end of verse 16, because he says, Receive him back as a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see, in essence, the receiving him back was in that pre-existing relationship where reconciliation was required, where relationships need to be restored, where hurt and wrongs may have been done. And they they shared that that relationship which was restored. But there was also this newfound, wonderful sense where they were beloved brothers. And that transformed their relationship. It didn't cast it aside or or consign it to past history. They'd been through what they'd been through. And their relationship was what their relationship was, but it had been transformed, transcend, made into something so much more beautiful. Because they were brothers in the Lord, a new reality had come. Galatians 3, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And in Christ, and according to their spiritual relationship, they were one. The earthly relationship was not abolished, but it was transformed. A union with Christ does not do away with all distinctions, but rather it changes and it transforms them. As we conclude here this morning, I want you to think about the reconciliation that we see displayed within this letter to Philemon. And it's not similar to the reconciliation that we see advocated in the world around us and on the news and in the campuses of university or on the placards at protests. The two are actually opposed to each other, incompatible. Biblical reconciliation is not a a truth-telling or racial literacy and all that those terms imply. Biblical reconciliation doesn't involve tearing down of statues, tearing down of institutions, dismantling power structures. Biblical reconciliation doesn't involve decolonization, reparations, or speaking truth to power. Biblical reconciliation doesn't dismantle and deconstruct. It transforms. It regenerates. It brings new life from within the hearts of transformed men and women. Why? Because the reconciliation that man requires first and foremost is a reconciliation with God. It is to him that we must be reconciled. And as long as we are alienated from God, we will be at war with one another. Apart from him, we are not only haters of God, but haters of men and of his image that we see within those men. With hearts that become contrary to one another, filled with murder, hatred, strife. We distort justice, dishonor authority, cover, lie, and steal. We must first be reconciled to God. And this only happens through the preaching of the gospel, through the accompanying, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, whereby we are born again and created new, as Philemon had been, an evidence towards the saints, and as Onesimus was, an evidence in his life towards Paul. And then we see that those two men were reconciled one to another. We repent, we turn to him in faith. We are justified, adopted, sanctified, all by virtue of our union with Christ. And we share that with one another. 
you and me. Ephesians 4, 4-7 says, We are one body in one spirit with one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And this spiritual reality transcends every earthly division. It transforms all our earthly distinctions. It brings restoration to fractured relationships. It brings healing. It brings forgiveness and restoration. Reconciliation is found in Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the power of your word here in this place this morning. We thank you for the example you have preserved here in Scripture of the, the reconciling work of the gospel and the grace of God, a work in the lives of men who lived in very real situations and circumstances real, with real grievances and, and hurts and, and wrongs that had been done. But we see you laying all this aside within their lives as they are given new hearts that love you and love each other accordingly. I pray that you would help us to be that one with each other, that we would seek to live lives, Lord God, in light of our union with you and our communion with each other. May we love each other and may we preach, Lord, a reconciliation to this world that says, be reconciled to God, who through Christ is reconciling all things to himself. May we point people to you. We pray, and may you make this effectual through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.